Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Unleashed with Carrie. Today, I'm here with Andy. I don't know him at all. We met in a Facebook group, uh, but he seems to be the exact kind of person I am looking to chat with. His day job is marketing for a stainless steel company, but really, that's not his passion. He likes to spend his time and his thoughts um, in building a community of artists. So I'm going to have him talk about that and, and we'll get into what his school experience was like and kind of how he's really different now than he was in school. Um, so Andy, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me on the show, Carrie. Absolutely. Can, can you talk about this community of artists that you've, you've built? Sure. Uh, we're located in uh, Plymouth, Mass, America's hometown, and we started back in 2011 just because as a small group of friends just kind of getting together and, uh, you know, being social and, and drawing and kind of uh, remembering what it was like to have fun to draw and not just for work um, because we had some professional artists. And it, I mean, that was back in 2011, so we're quickly approaching our 10-year anniversary. And since then, it's kind of steamrolled almost out of control where we just kind of, anytime we're approached, we say yes. Um, so we hang out for local businesses, we run art shows, uh, we run different art events, art fairs, uh, beer mug paintings, we've done paint nights, we've done uh, coloring events, uh, just anything that we think is fun. Um, and even stuff that we're starting to expand to stuff that isn't even necessarily visual arts, but even performing arts. We have some music projects that we're working on, and we did a, a viewing of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. So just anything that we think is fun, and uh, it's it's been a blast, and it's made us so many great connections that I'm I'm always constantly surprised at where we've gone. How do you have time for all of that? I don't watch <laughs> TV. I. Uh, it, it, I basically eat and sleep it. Um, so I, I work my day job. I get out. I, you know, I do something immediately after work. And there's a great. I'm very lucky to live in this town because this town has a great support system. Uh, there's two two streets in Plymouth here, um, Main Street and Water Street, and that's where all the tourists are. And the business owners on those streets are amazing. Uh, you'd think they'd all be in competition with themselves, with, with each other rather, uh, but there's such a great bond and they've just kind of welcomed us in and, and they've all been a huge help. So this community, do you gain from that financially or is this just fun? Well, so when we started it, I worked uh, at a crappy retail job. Uh, I had to be up super early, had to travel for it. Uh, I worked for a big box retail store and I was in a different store each day and I hated it. Hated life, was not happy. And so when we first came up with the name for the group that we have, um, it was intended to become a business and it was all about how can we make this make money and that was kind of our driving force and it never really took off. And then once we kind of, I got this new job and I'm much happier and, and everything's, you know, grand. Um, that's when I kind of just changed my focus from uh, kind of my gain to what can I do for the community and what can I do to help other artists. And since then, now money is starting to come in. Um, so I, I think reasonably in five years, I'd be able to quit my day job and just do my inebriate art thing. Wow. Do you have an actual exit plan or are you just waiting to see? If Not happens? really. It's just kind of looking at now being like, oh, this is real money coming in and, and kind of looking at the things that we've already committed to next year. I think we've already committed to over 30 dates next year. And um, just kind of looking at that and kind of like rough money wise, I'm like, that's like real money. Because normally, as long as we break even, we don't care you know, because we're having fun, we're meeting cool people. I've met some of my best friends from events that we have, and, and I feel like I've known them forever, and we look back, and I'm like, oh, I've only known you two years, um, but everyone is so active in the community that, you know, they come out to all our events, and you just get to know these people, and then you start to, 
you know, oh, let's go over to your house and have a game night or, or let's go to the movies. And it just kind of steamrolls. And it, it's that to me is most rewarding. And we've had just some phenomenal uh, feedback from people that I almost want to talk them out of their feedback because I'm like, that that's not that's not a thing. Like, I didn't do that. You know, I was just trying to have fun. So it it reminds me a lot of what you said when you first started about it, you were trying to put the fun back into art. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a, um, a Plymouth Center for the Arts here in town and uh, not throwing shade at them at all. They do a great job, but they are known for being very traditional, um, clicky, political, you know, it, light bolt, uh, lighthouses and sailboats is kind of what I always say. And we, my favorite thing is when we have someone who comes up to me and they're like, this is the first art show I've ever hung in, or this is the first piece of art I've ever sold. And those are the people that make me happiest, not, oh, this is my 50th art show and I'm kind of mad that I didn't get a ribbon, you know, that kind of thing. So I don't, I don't want to deal with that. I want someone whose first art show to hang next to the person who's hung with 50, 50 art shows. Um, Cause it means more to that first person. And I mean, the first art show I hung in, I hung directly across from uh, a really famous artist named Drew Struzan, um, who I guarantee everyone may not know his name, but knows his work. And I was having panic attacks because I'm like, my art doesn't belong here. My isn't, and my piece sold in that show. So it, it really kind of gave me, you know, it, you know, it made me feel really great. And so I want to pass that along to other people. That's great. It it helps kind of validate you and, and help you move through imposter syndrome. Um, oh, I haven't moved through that at all. <laughs> <laughs> Not so, at all. So you still feel it? Oh, God, yes. Every day. Really? What is that yeah. like for you? Uh, it, it, it's... So there's three of us that started this group. Uh, one of them left, and we've replaced him with, with another third person. Um, and me and that person, his name's... His real name is Mike. We call him, like, everybody knows him as Fish. If you call him Mike, no one knows who you're talking about. So me and Fish do 99% of the work, and we're constantly looking at each other going, how how did this happen? Like, we're, we're not those people. And it's just we get more privilege and more opportunity and kind of, like, weird access to things that, like, you don't even think about. Like I said, we work a lot with breweries, and one of our most lo- – nearby ones the mayflower brewery uh will get really busy and you know fish got up to go to the bathroom and he just walks through the employee only door and someone's like does he work here and i'm like well no but we just do that at, like and people just don't they're like whatever you want well, you know oh just go back there and, and take care of it yourself so it's it's just with this weird it, it, it feels more like family than anything else but it, it's just this strange access that we have to things that we wouldn't expect to and and people give I I feel like people give us more credit than we deserve but I I hear all the time that you you get what you give when you focus on helping other people and giving to other people then that starts to come back to you and it sounds Mm -hmm. like that's what you've really done here you you dropped the whole idea of making money turned it into a passion project and now you're making money yeah, yeah. I mean, again, I'm not like retiring off of this money, but now it's getting to the point where it's real money coming in. And so now we have to make those kind of plans to be like, okay, so this isn't just a couple bucks here and there. We got to, you know, set up a, a bank account and, and do all this other work that yeah, we don't want to do. <laughs> That's all <laughs> the, the boring stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, to, to the, the nicest feedback I've ever gotten and I still don't feel like we deserve it uh there was one gentleman who was coming to our our figure drawing groups um found us online was part of our you know I I feel like everybody's part of it you know once they come a few times and I don't remember why it came up uh but we eventually had him on our podcast and he's like you know he's like I credit you guys for helping me stay off heroin and I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, I was going through a starting recovery when I found you guys and you gave me like a whole new thing to do and I'm selling my artwork now and I'm able to put it out there and it's 
you know, I've met new people. And he's like, I credit you for helping keep me off of heroin. And I'm like, I, I didn't do that. Like, I'm just, we're just here drawing, you know, we didn't do anything else. And so it was, it was extremely flattering and completely undeserved in my opinion, but you know, that's, that's not for me to say. What an amazing story. Yeah, I was, I was flabbergasted. So let's rewind a little bit to sure. school since oh, yeah. you know, I'm the educator here. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. What did you have this creativity in school? Oh, very much. Um, I mean, super early on elementary school, I, I loved and accelerated at um, art classes. I played musical instruments from a very young age. Um, I was in theater groups. So I've always kind of had a way to express myself uh, creatively. So when you got out of school, your day job that you hated, uh, mm-hmm. I forget what you said, what it was. Was that in the creative realm? Oh, uh, initially when it started, it had some creative elements to it, but it wasn't a creative job. Um, again, I, I said I, I had a, uh, a comic book shop when I was married. Um, when I got divorced, that kind of fell by the wayside and I just needed a job. And most of my experience was in retail and customer service. So I just kind of fell into that. Got it. So you were creative in school and that led to what? What was your experience like? Oh, um, well, you don't know. In school, it's your, the, there's no team art. So it, it, you be kind of, and that's kind of the whole idea behind the, the, the drink and draws that we started was it's taking a solitary thing and making it uh, communal. So I became into art, I think, because I was extremely shy. Um, I mean, I dabbled in sports here and there, but I, it was never really my thing. So I found when I felt most comfortable being alone was when I was creating because it, it allowed my my brain to come up with ideas and uh, stories and, and all sorts of things. And I, at the time it was, I felt sad about it, but I wouldn't go back and change it because I feel like my creative nature and my ability to come up with strange and unusual ideas that people seem to like um, all stems from that time of trying to entertain myself. Um, I grew up on a street where there was no other kids really in the neighborhood for the majority of my childhood, other than my sister. Um, so it was, you had to entertain yourself. You, you had to, you know, imagine a situation to play in. I don't imagine now with what you're doing, you're not the shy, lonely type. I mean, you're out in the community all the time. Yeah, it's, um, it's kind of flip-flopped in a completely different direction. Um, it, I, God, this was probably about a year ago, I'd gone out on a date and walking down Main Street after about the fifth person stopped to say hi. She's like, does this happen all the time? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it does. And it, it's, it becomes, it, it's, it's so weird because like as a kid, you're like, oh, I would love to be that guy. And then you become really well known and, and granted it's well known in a very small area. But still, it gets to those points where you're like, I just want to go out and have a bite to eat and not be interrupted. So you kind of, you'll, you'll have days where you'll try to schedule around where you go. So, you know, like, I don't want to be Andy today. I just want to be a nameless face. Um, you know, or you go to run into the grocery store, like, real quick, and then three people stop you. Um, it, is, it is the polar opposite of where I was in school. Um, and again, I wouldn't trade it. I, I love what I do, but it is very strange and, and leads to that imposter syndrome. And it still doesn't come natural. It, it is definitely still something that I have to work on. Um, so there, there's still remnants of, of me being, you know, uncomfortable and, and unsure of myself all the time. How, how did you make that transition? Even if you're struggling with, with the feelings behind it, how did you go from being shy to 
approachable and talking to people? Um, well, it came when I first started my, my first business, my comic book shop. Um, people came in and you're the only one there and you kind of, if you want the business to be successful, you have to make those overtures to people. Um, and it's a trial and error thing that, that, you know, I know lots of people who are socially awkward and, and will say something to someone and it just gets that weird, like, that's not normal kind of thing. And it's, it's just practice. It, it's just like anything else. It's, it's like building a muscle. The more you do it, um, the better you get at it. And you kind of have to just get a feel for it and be more comfortable. And um, the podcast is kind of the exact height of, you know, I'm interviewing people I don't know at all and having a conversation. And my favorite ones are the ones where you just meet this person and by the end, you're like, oh my God, I have a new friend. That's fantastic. And so, yeah, it, it, all I can say is it's just a matter of, I wanted to speak to people more to make my business successful. I paid attention to when things went wrong and tried not to beat myself up about it because you know you're gonna say dumb dumb stuff i say dumb stuff all the time and after a while i just kind of been like oh people do like me people do enjoy my company and now it's almost second nature and sometimes i find myself interviewing people just by accident you're you're kind of standing there talking and next thing you're asking them all sorts of questions and you're like i'm sorry am i interviewing you i don't mean to be and it's I'm uncontrollably social now. It's weird. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I always struggle with, I'm socially awkward, whatever. I talk to people, I say weird things, and then I, you know, try and go to bed at night and think about all these things I said and the way I should have said it differently. And, um, you know, I, I think it's really important for anyone listening is that they need to know you're always going to screw up and you're, there's probably some element that you're always going to feel uncomfortable and that that's okay. You have to get used to feeling uncomfortable from time to time if you want to make some progress. Oh, absolutely. It's just like if you're working out and you're, you're building muscles, the next day you're going to feel sore. You know, if you feel uncomfortable, that's your brain kind of going, okay, don't do that again. You know, maybe try saying it this way. And the one thing I've learned from being an artist is no one is more critical of your work than you. And it's the same thing with being social. Um, I've had, you know, in my group of friends, if you're not giving each other a hard time, you're not really one of the friends. So, you know, we're relentless and we'll pick on each other. And I had a friend of mine be like, Oh man, I think you're a little, you know, a little cross the line the other day. I'm like, Oh really? Oh my God. I, I would never expect anyone to to feel bad. And, and I then, you know, pick up the phone and, and text me like, you know, I was only joking. I didn't mean anything. Like, I don't, I don't even remember you saying that. So it's like, I feel like we remember the things that we say and that we feel uncomfortable. We remember that feeling of being uncomfortable. Meanwhile, that other person is, is gone about their business and they're focused on what, what they did that they screwed up. So it, it's very rarely about us. You know, that's us in our heads. So it's like, try not to be critical of yourself because you're overly critical of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. You know, when you're sitting there worrying about what you said or didn't say, the other person's probably thinking the same thing about themselves. Right. Or they're like, oh my God, I said this other thing to this other person. And that person is worried about something that they said to someone else. It, it, it's, it's so very rare that everybody's on the same page Yeah. When, when it comes to that sort of thing, because everyone is so focused on how they screwed up. So let's pretend for a second that you're, you're, you said owner of the comic book store? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, but let's pretend you're shy Andy from, from school and you're in the comic book store trying to, you know, get someone to buy something. What would that mm -hmm. have looked like? Uh, so the one thing that I realized at that point was I was not a good salesperson. So I never tried to get anyone to buy anything. Um, it was much easier because you're all sort of in the same mind. It's it's more about finding your your herd or your your group. 
You know, I started a business of something that I loved. I love pop culture and comics and movies and, and things like that. And so when people came in, they automatically had something in common. So it wasn't so much of being shy. It was more, and of course I'm shy, but you know, they come in, you'd be like, Hey, you know, standard greeting, how are you doing? How's today? Blah, blah, blah. But then they would go and they'd pick something up and you would automatically have something in common or be like, Oh, that's really good. Or I haven't read that yet. Or, Oh, you really like that thing. That's not so great. I mean, that's how I met fish. I mean, he's one of my best friends. He was a customer that came in. Uh, he picked up a comic book and I still can't remember what it was. And I gave him a hard time about it. I'm like, Oh, that's crap. I can't believe you read that. And, you know, it, it's just, you automatically have this bond because you have something in common. And so it, it's fine. You, you know, do you like baseball? Go to a baseball game. You're going to be able to turn to the person next to you, whether you know him or not, and talk baseball. If you like music, go to a music store and you know, you'd be able to ask questions to the guy there and you're going to be able to talk about music and find about what they like and, and learn about new things you know, new songs and whatnot so it's more start with things that you like and go from there and so once you feel comfortable on that avenue then you can reach out and go well i also like this other thing and then after a while you you've realized that you you are much better at speaking to strangers and then it's the you know, person at the grocery store or, you know the gas station and then, then you realize you can't shut up <laughs> So this, I think this is a really hard question to answer. Um, I okay. like to ask it of people. People ask me all the time and I don't have a good answer, but how would you recommend finding things you like? Because a lot of the students I work with, I think uh, from time to time struggle with finding those things to begin with because they spend so long in school and doing homework that they just don't have the time or opportunity or energy to explore what they like and they don't even know what's out there. How do you figure uh, it out? I feel like, and this is going to be my uh, old man get off my lawn moment, but I feel like it's way easier now because um, one of the things that I absolutely love to do, I love to play Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, I was fascinated with it as a kid, but being a kid, I didn't have that connection. I didn't have those people that I knew that could play. And I was always wanted to play. I always wanted to play. And then as I got older, I eventually found people. Now on the internet, you can just type in Dungeons and Dragons play online. You can find a group. I can shut this off right now and go play. Um, so you can jump on YouTube and you can pop around and there's a channel for everything. If you're even mildly interested in, oh, I wonder what it'd be like to scuba dive. You can type in scuba dive on YouTube and you can watch hours and hours of people scuba diving and go, oh, maybe that's something I want to see if I can learn. And then you can even type in learning to scuba dive and, and see about that and kind of, you know, baby step your way into it and to be like, okay, now I'm going to try and, and try it for myself. And if you don't like it, that's cool. You know, don't, it's not a big deal. No one likes everything. And sometimes it's, you don't like it right away. It takes, uh, you know, a couple tries. So you should always, you know, if you don't like it the first time, I tried skiing when I was a kid. I hated it. But then someone asked me, they're like, well, what was it like? I'm like, oh, it was super cold. And then like, it was snowing, but it was like icy snow. And the guy who's teaching me didn't speak English. So I'm trying to understand through French Canadian what I'm supposed to be doing. And they're like, yeah, that's why I don't like it. Because it, that first time wasn't enjoyable. Maybe you should give it another try. And so just, I'm going to take it back to what I was saying we do with uh inebriate now is when an opportunity presents it to you know someone comes to us about doing something we just say yes and then we go from there and sometimes it works and lots of times it doesn't we've had plenty of things um that we've tried to do that just didn't work and we're like well we gave it a try you know learned moved on and gone to do something else so and it's more about oops, sorry go ahead oh no i was gonna say i think it's important that we all remember it's okay to not like something it's okay to to screw up at something and to move on it's super important you should you should screw up stuff you should fail um if everything works great you learn nothing 
Um, if we had, if we host an event and we have 3,000 people walk through the door and we sell every piece of art, we didn't learn what we did. That could have just been an accident. If we go in and we have 12 people in and we maybe sell one piece of art, we're like, okay, well, what worked? What didn't work? What can we do better? You know, how can we make it better? Um, and part of that is kind of not everyone has that same drive. Not everyone, you know, who wants to be like me and overschedule themselves to an insane amount of work every day. Um, but that's just your personal choice. You know, you, you find what's comfortable for you, what works for you. And at the end of the day, if you're happy, then that's all that counts. I, uh, I don't know if you noticed, I held myself back from saying the word failure. Because lately I've been thinking about, in my mind, failure and loss are really different. Failure for me is you didn't try or you gave up before you tried, you know, gave it your all or you screwed up and you didn't try again. Whereas loss mm -hmm. is you tried and it didn't work and you made the decision, the conscious decision to step away or you screwed up and you tried again. So I've, I've kind of been trying to define them differently, but we're still talking about the same idea. Yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've heard people say that, like you only fail when you stop trying. Like yeah. I've heard that over and over again. The way I look at it is if I just, in my, and this is just my opinion, if I call it what it is, if I failed, okay, that's great. But if I don't let it bother me, then I kind of take the power away from that word and I don't get intimidated by that word. And so if someone goes, what do you, you know, what if you fail? You're like, all right, whatever. I just move on. You know, just because I failed once doesn't make me a failure. You know, I've played basketball. It doesn't make me a basketball player. So it's, you just, in it's so cliche to say, you know, you only fail when you give up, but yeah, that's it. If you keep pushing, if you hear these stories of these people that even the ones that seem like they're an overnight success, you know, it's usually pretty miserable up until the point where it like takes off. Until they had that moment of overnight success. Right. Yeah. Yes. And, and, but you're not going to get that unless you put in the work and, you know, there's very little luck involved. Luck is more, it is most of the time everyone misses luck because they're not prepared to say yes, to take part, to do something that someone will, will kind of offer something and fear is, is more of a dangerous word than failure because You're... fear is what prevents you from trying again. Fear is what prevents you from trying in the first place. You're never going to get that moment of luck, even if it does come into play, unless you're showing up and you're trying and you're mm -hmm. not getting attached to that failure. Absolutely. Right. And then um, the, the really uh, interesting point, and, and I'm learning this more and some of the podcasts I listen to talk about it a lot. And I think it was in a movie called Parenthood with Steve Martin. They're talking with the grandfather and he says there is no touchdown moment. You know, like you don't score a touchdown in life. Like we will have a great show or, or a great event or a podcast that gets, you know, more downloads than we've ever gotten. And you're like, great, I'm on to something else already. It, it, you know, there's no moment where life raises you up on the shoulder and, you know, the credits roll. It, it, that's not how life works. You know, you, you take your victory and you kind of just move on and it's the same thing with the defeat. You just have to kind of keep rolling with it and just kind of it all, as long as you keep moving in the right direction overall, you're, you're doing pretty good. And that, that right direction is whatever you want it to be. It doesn't have to be. With it's happiness. It, it, it's yeah. absolutely happiness. Yeah. Um, life is too short to not be happy. And if a million dollars is what really makes you happy, it's probably not, then that's what you should shoot for. Um, when I left that retail company that I was working for, they were pushing me to get promoted. And I was, that was probably the worst point when I was there. And I didn't even know why I was so miserable. And for whatever particular reason, my, I was, my car wasn't functioning that day and I had to walk home. And it was only about a mile, luckily. And so on that walk home, I realized I'm like, I don't want that promotion. I'm not going to put in for that promotion. That promotion is enough money to change my life financially, but it would have canceled all the 
community building, all the Nibiru stuff, I wouldn't be gone. I wouldn't be doing it. And I'm like, I wouldn't be happy. Like, why would I do that to myself? So in my life, the money isn't what makes me happy. What makes me happy is meeting these people, building this community and, and apparently making a difference in other, in other people's lives, which just sounds so strange, but you know, the number of times that people thank me for what we do is still staggering. It happens all the time. Where did this positive mindset or whatever you want to call it come from? A lot of people I feel like have, uh, you know, read a book or had a light bulb moment that just made this mindset shift. Have uh, it, was you always... from, it was from therapy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I got divorced, I was in a really dark place. And uh, so I, I went to a therapist and, you know, uh, I feel like as I go through life, I, I feel like time is uh, showing that there's less stigma attached to that, which is great. Um, there's less stigma attached to talking about mental health and, and problems. And so it's part of why um, I like doing things like this, because if my struggles help someone else, then that's great. You know, I still struggle with self-esteem really bad. Um, I still struggle. The shyness thing is much easier in most circumstances, but there still are circumstances that are, I really struggle with. And um, so, you know, it's an ongoing thing. It doesn't go away. There's no, there's no touchdown. There's no light bulb moment. It's, it's a process. You constantly have to work at it. And I, I try to, I hated my retail job, but I learned a lot, a lot from it. And one thing they always said is if you can leave the store a little bit better than when you got there, you've done your job. So if I can be a little bit better today than I was yesterday, if I can do a little more Navy at work today than I did yesterday, it's a cumulative. It all builds on itself. So it, you know, it's, it's, it's what about Bob? It's baby steps. So, so with this whole therapy idea, a lot of my students, uh, it's been recommended they see a therapist or they go, but they really struggle with finding someone they connect with. Were you able to just hop in there and, and get going or was that a, a process for you? Um, well, this is, this is a, this is an actual luck moment. The first, I had three therapists just through insurance and, you know, life, whatnot, and the first one was amazing. I just got lucky. Um, she was exactly what I needed at that exact moment. Um, even to the point where I could pick up the phone and call her and just be like, Hey, I am struggling with this one thing. I don't want to bother you, but she was there. She was very approachable. And I'm, I don't sure not all therapists will do that. Um, and then I had another one that all he wanted to do was like, oh, did you see the game last night? I'm like, no, man, I'm not here to talk about the game. You know, that's not why I'm here. Um, but a lot of it has to do with being really honest with yourself and wanting to make change. I was at a point I wanted to make change. I wanted to improve my life. I wanted to be happy. And so a lot of times you have to sit down and, and you know, tough love yourself and, and just be like, yeah, uh, that's something I need to work on. I I failed at that, but I'm not going to, you know, let that stop me. And, and I found a lot of motivation in uh, a lot of movies, a lot of people that, you know, I found really inspirational um, and learned little baby steps to just make life better. And, you know, like I said, I still work at it every day. Do, have you heard of the new, I don't know how new it is, but my new favorite thing right now is uh, Dungeons and Dragons therapy. So therapists will create um, a, a campaign and mm -hmm. help the, the participants create characters that are reflective of, you know, problems they need to solve in their life, whether it's, you know, overcoming shyness or their reactions to certain problems. Um, but I've heard a lot about that lately, and I'm so interested in either trying it out myself or, or finding a, an avenue for my students to give it a try. Um, I am not familiar with that specifically, but I'm a huge fan of Dungeons and Dragons. Like I said, uh, it is one of the reasons 
that gets my friends together to hang out. It, it's a great social environment to be in. Um, there are some, you know, tricks and, and downfalls that you have to watch out for. Um, cause you can, if you get with a, a group that maybe doesn't want to play the same way that you play or has a different goal in mind, it can seem like you don't like the game, but it could just be the fact that you don't want to play the way they play. And that's what makes D and D so great is it is so open, so free form that there is no wrong way to play. There is no right way to play. Um, if you are, sorry, it counts on my mouse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that in the instructions, it literally says that you can feel free to use and not use whatever rules you want. So everyone plays a little bit different. And it's, it, you know, the problem solving is great. It's fun. It can be silly. It can be serious. I, I don't know therapeutically how it works, but I recommend anyone play. Yeah. So you said you you saw some positive movies and influencers. What what were those things or people who influenced you? Um, the so the one that probably touched me the most in the beginning. I'm going to tell you the title, and you're going to be confused. It's called Murder Ball, and yep. it is. Uh, are you familiar with it? No, no. Oh, okay. I, that was the. Yep, I'm confused. Uh, it is a documentary about the USA paraplegic rugby team. Uh, these are uh, people who have, through a bunch of different circumstances, been uh, sent, it's not, I don't wanna say sentenced, because that's not right, but they, they're in a wheelchair for the rest of their lives. And they play one of the most hardcore physical games I've ever seen. And, you're watching this and they're not, there's no, oh, isn't this sad or pity party me it is we're just guys. We're going to get in bar fights. We're going to cause trouble. We're athletes. We're going to work harder than anyone else to win. And at one point they ask, uh, they were on Larry King and the captain of the team, Mark Zupan is asked if you were given a cure that you could stand up and walk away, but you wouldn't be able to play this rugby. Would you take the cure? And Mark Zupan's answer is no. He's like, before I was just a regular guy. He's like, now I'm an Olympic level athlete. I have a gold medal. He's like, I'm on Larry King. So it's kind of, it really kind of put me in the mindset of, you may be in a bad situation. You may have struggles, but you can take that situation and make it special. You can, you know, you can excel no matter what your situation is. And Any... I'm way better off than that guy. I can walk around. And so it was just really inspiring. I've never heard of it, but now I really want to. I love your take it. on it. Uh, it it's, it, it's a phenomenal movie. It's not family friendly. Um, so I would not, I don't know how old your students are, but I wouldn't make a recommendation. Um, it is definitely rated R. And like I said, they're guys. It is, they don't, tone down their language, they don't tone down their behavior. Um, and Mark Zupan, I think, is inspirational, but not necessarily likable. Interesting. Yeah, he's kind of a jerk, and but that's fine. Like, there's jerks everywhere. Just because he's in a wheelchair doesn't mean he's, he's not going to be a jerk. Yeah. So it's a great movie I recommend. Kind of hard to find because it's a documentary, but it's definitely worth a watch. Any other books or motivational speakers or? Oh, man. Um, I love that your answer is different. I've never had anyone give me that answer. What? I usually hear the, the murder ball. Oh, murder movie. ball? I've yeah, never it's, heard it's that. Great. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's such a good movie, too. And it's, it's a documentary. And if you wrote it as a sports movie, you wouldn't do nearly as good a job because there's a bad guy in it and it's it's phenomenal and it's fun and they're funny and um man motivation that's really hard because it's kind of what inspires you and so I was like I said I was in a really dark spot so I was trying to find you know people that kind of work themselves out of dark spots and um I kind of really became interested in, oh God, 
now I'm going to try to remember his name. Um, they made a movie about him. Um, uh, Will Abagnale, no, is it Will? I think it's Will. Abagnale Jr. Um, he's the main character in the movie Catch Me If You Can. Um, it's a Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks movie, which is a very entertaining movie. But when I found out he was a real person and, you know, he screwed up his life as a kid and, you know, did jail time and then came out of jail and started working for um, the Secret Service, basically hunting down the people that did the same thing that he did and all the advancements that he helped. You know, it, I just find it fascinating when someone doesn't let life dictate how they should be because you know everybody has hard times everybody has tough times and it's it's the if you can get through it and move on and, and just turn you turn your life around and, and you know be a physical or self-inflicted or even just people that just happen to have you know fate roll them a critical one and that's a dnd thing i'm sure you may not understand that, but it's not a good, good thing. Uh, so yeah, if you have a critical fail in life, if you can and turn that around and, and make a success out of it, it's to me, it's more poignant that someone who's been successful their whole life and had it handed to them. Yeah, for sure. And I, I love how you said that you kind of have to find your own motivation. Like you have to find what inspires you and that not necessarily going to the same source that everyone else goes to is automatically going to set you on the path that you're Yeah, it may not, you know, it could be a song, it could be a writer. Um, you just never know. And it comes back to that. You have to be open and paying attention and listening because you don't know, is that inspiration going to come from someone you know? Uh, is it going to be, you know, someone that you work with? Um, a tragic story that you hear about and that, you know, really touches, you know, touches your heart, the way they handle it. You just never really know where that inspiration is going to come from. Do you have any daily habits, rituals, routines that keep you going? Um, I have a planner and I've tried to use my phone and it never seems to work. Um, it gets to the point, Fish calls it my brain. Because if someone asks me a question, I don't have it. I can't answer the question. I don't know. Um, I, it, it's become, I don't even want to say security blanket, but probably security blanket. Um, it's where all my appointments go. It's where all my scheduling goes. And that has been critical for me because I can look at a glance and be like, oh, I have Tuesday off do I want to not do something on Tuesday or do I want to do something on Tuesday? And, uh, and even when I was going through therapy, I had one of these and uh, I was very depressed at the time. And I'd actually track my depression on, I think, I can't remember if I was a scale of one to five or one to 10 on a daily basis. And just the act of tracking the depression helped it get better because if I'm like, oh man, I'm like an eight, I'd be like, whoa, wait, why am I an eight? I should do something. And just the, you know, me tracking it helped make it better. So if, you know, the, the planner, just using it in a bunch of different ways has really helped. And now if I lose it, I'm, you know, up the creek without the paddle. Is it your typical kind of calendar, you know, date and times planner? Or is it, a, a, you know, yeah, one of the special like fancy... A... Um, I wouldn't say it's fancy. It's, they're actually not, they're not cheap. Um, you can get kind of cheaper ones, but it, you know, it has, um, the, the, the month at a glance, and then you can kind of flip behind that and go into individual, um, days and look at the different days. So, I mean, that's how I, I book my podcast guests. I run all of Inebriar goes through there. Um, uh, you were on the calendar for today and you know stuff like that yeah do you know what makes you gravitate towards the pencil paper planner in, instead of your phone or a, you know an app or something i think it comes from being an artist and probably playing dnd both of those things can be done digitally you know so many people now do art on ipads and 
you know, play D&D online and, and using tablet programs to play d and I've been pencil and paper from day one. Um, so I think it just fits me well because, you know, I've always had a sketchbook, you know, sketchbook and a planner, very similar. Uh, so I'm sure that has something to do with it, but, uh, yeah, I'm kind of a tactile I like to have it in person. You know, I'm not an Amazon shopper. I like to go to the store and pick something up. So it's probably got something to do with that. So you're not necessarily anti-technology so much as this just works better oh, for you. Oh, no. Yeah, no, it's absolutely whatever works better for you. Um, yeah. You know, that, and that's part of, you know, that goes back to you have to find what's inspirational to you. It, it's, you have to find out what makes you happy. Um, if it's a planner, use a planner. If it's a calendar on your phone, do that. If, you know, uh, Slipknot inspires you to be a better person, then listen to Slipknot. You know, it's... It, it's uh, it's so personal for any people can only make suggestions on things to try N no one can tell you how to do it that's so important to me in the work i do with students because a lot of times they hear the same suggestions over and over again you know i work with kids with uh primarily adhd and anxiety and there's mm -hmm. these set of skills that yep. the non-adhd and anxiety brains tell the ADHD and anxiety brains. And sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But I feel like um, it's important that, that kids can hear a suggestion, figure out if it works for them or not, and then stick with it or, or move on. And that just because someone is telling you to do it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna work. Right, you have to give it a try, like a good honest try, um, not the, little kid oh well, i tried it you know no right. go try it for like an honest try and if it doesn't work again that's fine just you know maybe part of it works maybe you want a daily planner for something but you want to keep most things in your phone that's fine again if it works and you're happy and your life is improved then that's the way to do it and if someone tells you that it's the wrong way to do it they're wrong it's, it's just as simple as that do you have any words of wisdom for families who are struggling with their teens or young adults? You know, they're, they're at rock bottom or they don't know what to do or what's next. Like, how do you, how do you move through that and get to the other side? Oh God, that's a really tough one. Um, <laughs> geez, at rock bottom. Um, so a couple of things I think are super important and, you know, families, personal relationships, everything. Um, one is communication. And communication isn't just being like, I have this problem and you need to listen to me. It's a two-way street. Um, we were talking about it, how you, you said you don't plan questions. I don't plan questions on my podcast because I feel like it engages me to listen. You have to listen to what the other person says as much as you want them to listen to you. Um, you have to be honest with yourself. So when someone says, you know, you're, you're always on your phone, you can't just come back with, you're always on your phone. Like you have to go, okay, wait, am I, is that a thing? You know, they have apps for that Track it on an app, you know, self-reflection is huge. You know, no one is perfect. No one's close to perfect. And just kind of accepting that and being really genuine. Take a really genuine look at yourself and, and what you can do to be better and to be better for other people. And I think that goes a long way. And then maybe lastly is, and this is for a parent, because I have two kids and I had parents. Um, when my kids were very little, I made the determination that whatever they want to say to me, I'm going to listen. So I've had hours and hours and hours of conversation about wrestling that I wish I had those hours back in one because I have no interest. But my son wanted to talk about it and I wanted to be able to listen. So you have to be able to listen to the stuff that you don't want to hear so that when they have something important to tell you, they know that they can come talk to you. That is excellent advice, I think. Um, I hope so. <laughs> I, so my kids are four and two, and 
not so much in the talking, but in the, the playing, there are, I love kids. I've always yeah. loved kids. There are certain things I like to play with my little kids and there are certain things that I really don't. And I try really hard to, to do what you said, like with talking that if this is what they want to play and this is mom and kid time, then, right. then we're doing it. And I, it, it would be so easy for me to persuade them to do something I love. Like, Hey, don't you want to read a book instead? And I know right, they're right. going to say yes, but no, if they want to play with Barbies, I am going to figure out how to play with Barbies, even though I've never liked to play with Barbies. <laughs> yeah, um, it's like you have to realize that they're their own person. And, you know, just because they're little doesn't mean they shouldn't have agency over their life. And if they like something, let them like it. You know, great. Okay, sure. Let's play Barbies. And, you know, you may never know. You may be like, hey, I really enjoy playing Barbies with my kids. Um, I have yet to really enjoy talking wrestling with my son, but I mean, he's 17 now, but we still will sit down and we'll talk about it. And I'll, I'll try to be like, Oh, I heard this. Is that a thing? Is this person still wrestling? And, you know, and he appreciates the effort of me trying to talk about what he likes to talk about. And, um, I don't feel, you know, I was a child of the seventies and eighties. That was definitely not a thing back then. It was, you know, go play in the other room. Grownups are talking. And it kind of, I think it devalues their opinion and whether or not that's part of the reason why I struggle with self-esteem, I don't know, maybe, but I want them to know that what they have to say is important to me. Have you spoken on stage or coached anyone? I know you have your podcast, but I feel like, I feel like you're going to be an amazing coach if you wanted to be or be on stage. Everything you're saying is so quotable and so motivating. Oh, geez. See, now the imposter, imposter syndrome kicks in because <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, this goes back to me being a kid. You know, I was always in the art room, in the music room, or on stage. On stage, I feel very comfortable, even as a kid. Um, and a lot of people think that's weird. If it's in a, a room full of people, I can talk. That's fine. I got no problem. Uh, one on one, totally different story. Uh, so we have started doing a couple talks about podcasting. Um, have I thought about speaking? Yeah, I've thought about it, but I honestly don't really know how to go about it or really, cause I tend to ramble and I don't plan. So I'm like, Oh God, if I, you know, they're going to want me to write something and, and have a, a through line that I want to hit certain beats, but you know, I don't, I don't know if I have a Ted talk in my future. Okay. Maybe. Well, I think you do. Well, I'd consider it, but, you know, who knows? Well, there you go. You know me, you know me I'd say yes. So if someone was like, hey, would you speak? I'd be like, great, sure. Um, well, yeah, now I'm just going to find a place for you to speak. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> you got to start somewhere. <laughs> sure. All right. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll let you go in a minute here, but, but like you, I experienced the, you can put me on stage and I'm okay. Well, I have mm -hmm. a few minutes of nervousness, of course. Um, but that whole one-on-one -on -one or like small group thing, and that drives me crazy. And I think because for me, when I'm on stage, I can control the room. I can control the situation. I'm in charge. Even if I'm not that good at it, people think I'm in charge because I'm the one on the stage. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's the same for you, but. Uh, I found that I don't even think about people being there because there's less to focus on in a weird sort of way. There's more there. I mean, it depends on the, the lighting. Some places you can't even see the audience. So it's like, I'm the only person here. But even if there's an audience full of people, who am I focusing on? I'm not like focused on one person. So I'm not really thinking about what is that person thinking about me? I'm thinking about what I'm saying, what I have to do. You know, do I have to play a certain chord? Do I have to say a certain line? That's where I'm focused, not what is that guy in the third row thinking? And I think that's the hang up as you start thinking about what, what you know, what are people thinking about me? And am, am I screwing up? Are they judging me? And if I ha don't have that singular person to focus on, I just, I don't even think about it. So, yeah, but it is the one-on-one -on -one thing that, that's killer um, and still not always easy. I'm... I'm with you there, which is funny <laughs> considering I work with my students one on one, but that's that's different, I think, because it's it's what I'm good at and what I know work, how work, to do. Yeah, work is definitely different. 
Um, and I don't know why. I, I've been on another podcast and we were talking about that. And he's like, well, do you deal with people one-on-one -on -one at work? I'm like, yeah, that's work. And he's like, yeah, but how's that different? I'm like, I don't know. Like in my mindset, it's different. Um, and even now, you know, when I was a kid, it was everybody that I struggled with. Now it's very specific. Um, I'm single and trying to date is terrible. I'm horrible at it. Um, it was never a skill I picked up. And that's, that, that is where I still struggle with that anxiety and, you know, speaking to someone kind of like, if I'm not thinking about it, if they just happen to be somewhere at an event or whatever, then yeah, fine. I have no problem talking to you. The second I start being like, I'm mildly interested in this person, then my brain just shuts down. And then you kind of go through that, like, I should say something. What do I say? Oh my God, it's been too long. I can't say something now. It'd be weird. You know, and it's that whole like bad cycle of thinking that just locks you up. I love that you just said that because I feel like so many, so many people experience that, not necessarily in the, the dating realm, but in, in whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, so any, any remaining words you would like to share? Um, and also if you can tell people how to get in touch with you, if they want to hear more about you or your art groups, your podcast. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, remaining words. Oh, God, I feel like all I've done is ramble. Um, just try to be happy. Find out what you really love to do. And, you know, if you can make it your career, that's great. Um, but even just try to make it a big part of your life and you'll be surprised at, you know, how, how it turns you around and gives you something to, to look for. Like a hobby is huge and your hobby could be watching football if that's what you love to do and makes you happy. Um, and try to give back, you know, I feel like that's important. Um, and the better off you are, I think the more obligation you have to try and help others to achieve that happiness. Um, and people can find me at, um, uh, so our group's called Inebriart. We're based out of Plymouth, Mass. Um, it looks like next year we may be expanding to another town in Massachusetts, so that's exciting. Um, and we're definitely, we're based around bars, restaurants, and distilleries. Um, so we're definitely an adult group. We do have some people that are younger um, that participate in our events, um, kind of high school age. But, you know, we're not... A, my podcast is not family friendly. Um, but uh, you can go to inebriart.com, spelled like inebriate, but ends in art. Um, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, we have four podcasts, they're all on the website. Um, we have drawing events, tons of things in Plymouth. If you like art, it's definitely a place to go. And the one thing that we do have that's super family friendly on our Facebook page, we have a daily drawing challenge. So every day at 8 p.m., there's a post that prompts you to draw something based on the month's theme. Um, you post your sketch in the comments. At the end of the month, whoever has the most drawings in, or if there's a tie, we, we draw a name, um, wins a prize. And this month is dinosaurs, next month is bugs. We've done Star Wars, we've done flowers, birds, cartoon characters, anatomy. Uh, we've been doing it for several years now. It's just, it's very fun. We have you know, kids that enter, we have adults that enter, we have one person who hasn't missed in, let's see, one year, 10 months, and 27 days, um, so she's killing it, it's, it, and even if you just like to look at cool drawings, it's a good place to go. Well, thank you so much for being here, I really appreciate your time. No problem, this was uh, fun. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely have to stay in touch, I'm curious how your group goes, and and if you uh, decide to make your exit. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I've decided to. I just, it's facilitating that decision that that's, that's where the work and what, you know, comes. Well, I'm, I'm curious to follow that journey, too, because okay. it's going to be a good one. Uh, yeah, I'll invite you to my TED Talk. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. I will catch up with you sometime soon. Thank you awesome. again. Thank you.